Hello everyone, my name is Charles Vaillancourt, SRA Team Lead for Public Cloud at OVH Cloud, and I'll be your host today. Before we begin this virtual academy, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping points with you. Firstly, the OVH Cloud Virtual Academy will last approximately 40 minutes, and there'll be a Q&A session at the end. Feel free to ask your questions anytime during the presentation in the chat, and we'll go over them at the end of the presentation. Also, this session will be recorded, and we'll send you a copy as soon as it's available. First, we'll go over an overview of what is Kubernetes. Next, we'll go over the journey from Minikube to a production cluster. And finally, we'll deploy our first Kubernetes cluster on OVH Cloud. Before we begin, just a little bit more information about OVH Cloud. We're a global cloud service provider who own and operate our own 32 data centers across the world. We're a leader in Europe, and we're active in Canada since 2011, with one of the largest data centers in North America, here in Beauharnois. Our offers vary from dedicated servers to virtual private servers, hosted private clouds, public cloud, and we also have solutions for storage, network, and security. Today, we're gonna to focus mostly on public cloud and especially on Kubernetes. Here we can see an oversimplification of what a Kubernetes cluster would look like. Oversimplification because there's usually more than one master node. If we take a closer look at what an actual cluster looks like from an operation standpoint, firstly, we have the kubectl, which is the CLI used to interact with the cluster through its API. Next, we have the master node, which we've seen previously. The master node hosts the API server to answer all the queries. It hosts the scheduler, who's aware of the resource allocation, the image locations. And there's also the cloud controller manager, which talks to the infrastructure service provider behind to allocate resources such as load balancers, new nodes, or as well as persistent volumes. Next, there's the kube controller, which is the brain of the operations. And lastly, there's the ETCD state, state database cluster. There's also a very rich ecosystem of tooling that you can use to interact with your cluster, such as the Kubernetes dashboard or C Advisor and Prometheus monitoring for your infrastructure. Next, let's look at a kubelet. A kubelet is services that runs on the nodes. It's listening for work from the controller and triggers the actions on the container runtime. There's also present on the nodes a kube proxy which is the component that allows to forward traffic to and from your nodes to their respective pods. And finally, there's the container runtime, the underlying technology that will run the containers. In 95% of deployments, this is usually Docker. We can also look at different ways that we can have to expose services with the Kubernetes. You can expose your pods, your replica sets, your deployments, your services, as well as control the ingress flow management of all the interrelationships between your services. From traditional applications to ones deploys, deployed in the cloud, there's already some differences. Usually, we'd deploy your application straight on the operating system on a bare metal machine. When you migrate to the cloud, you abstract the hardware layer in, inside a virtual machine. And when you containerize your application, you add yet another abstraction layer to deploy your application not only with the code that runs it, but also with its dependencies. Container images are a way to package your application with its dependencies. Containers are great for developers. They allow to define how your application needs to interact with other containers, as well as easily packaging your application with its dependencies. Once you've containerized your application, if it works locally, it'll work anywhere Docker is present. But from an operation standpoint, it's a completely different story. How do you manage the deployment of the application? It's container interactions, high availability, replication, persistent storage, load balancer, the list goes on and on. Now imagine managing microservices by hand with pure Docker. You need to manage versioned endpoints, service availability, service redundancy, and you have to have an easy workflow so that you can add and remove microservices on demand. Here comes Kubernetes to help you tame those services. As we've seen previously, a Kubernetes cluster is mostly split into two different components, the master nodes and the worker nodes. And those worker nodes will interact with the master nodes through the API server to deploy the state that will be defined and passed on to them. This state is defined into a YAML file that is then passed to the Kubernetes cluster through its API. The scheduler will then allocate the resources to the worker nodes, and they'll eventually deploy the workload over there. This allows for easy state management, not only for your services, but the way the ingress traffic is controlled, the way your services are deployed, the way you can have replica sets of your deployments, as well as a bunch of other features. Kubernetes can be extended very easily. You can add components such as C-Advisor or Prometheus to add monitoring to all of your pods with a single click. By using a simple off-the-shelf Kubernetes state file, you can enable such features with little effort. There are also many components that can help you manage the service lifecycle and codependencies of your service. You can control the way your services will connect, 
the way they securely communicate with each other, the control flow of all the interactions between the containers, as well as observe all the metrics that they produce. This allows for rolling upgrades, A-B testing, canary testing, edge traffic management, as well as multi-cluster service meshes. Kubernetes also allows for a very straightforward and easy way to control multi-environment de deployments. You deploy your application once in, de in development environment, and you can deploy the same application in staging and prod once you're ready to go. The concept behind Kubernetes is very straightforward. Define the service once, deploy it many times. You can go from dev to staging to prod on a multi-cluster or multi-cloud with minimal effort. Now that we've been over some of the features of Kubernetes, let's go what would look like your first steps inside the Kubernetes world. Usually, you would start with Minikube. Minikube is a tool that lets you run Kubernetes locally, and it runs a single node Kubernetes cluster on your personal computer. Minikube is an awesome tool to discover Kubernetes and start getting your hands dirty. But it is not a production cluster. Nowhere near. It doesn't have the performances to scale up your application. It's a single node deployment, so there's no way to validate high availability and redundancy of your services. And there's no real way to test any type of real life scenario load testing. So let's go over what a journey would look like from Minikube to deploying your first production cluster. Minikube is only the beginning. Most of the talks that you'll see uh, and tutorials out there, including this one, will stop at presenting what Kubernetes is. We won't go into the steps to deploy a production cluster. There are many steps to go through and many hurdles along the way. Let's go through some of them. First, there's the network complexity. There are different network drivers that offer a wide range of configurations. There's also a lot of inter-cluster communication that will happen dynamically as pods live and die. All this traffic needs to be accounted for to run a secure, production cluster. Securing the cluster is not only about the network, and it's something not at all for the faint of heart. Your journey starts here. You'll have to secure the cluster, not only as its deployment, but also at the operating system level, the network level. You'll need to make sure that you respect every security advisory out there for every software involved. You'll need to minimize your OS to reduce attack vectors. You'll need to constantly patch and update your cluster. And these are only a few things to consider. There's also the storage dilemma. There are many different storage solutions out there that exist for persistent volumes. Each have their advantages and drawbacks, and there are also different complexity levels. NFS, Ceph, GlusterFS, use Cinder as a backend. Do you want local storage? All of these questions you'll need to answer if you want to deploy your own production cluster. And lastly, there's also the ETCD vulnerability. ETCD, as we've said before, is the database that holds the state of all your applications. By default, in a cluster, there's only a single node. If you want to run a real-life production cluster, you'll need to add redundancy to this ETCD. This alone is pretty complex. So just to recap, unless you have enough manpower to go through all of these steps before starting to think of deploying an application, it's a common thing in the community to suggest avoiding this as much as possible and to leverage uh, public services. Now let's go over some of the reasons why you'd want to use OVH Cloud's Kubernetes services. Firstly, you'll spare money and time from day one. You'll deploy your cluster within minutes. You'll also benefit from free masters that are operated and controlled by OVH Cloud staff. You also benefit from a CNCF certified cluster to get a very standard services, as well as benefit from most tutorials and public charts that are available on the web today. Also, you have the same as day two operations. Contrary to testing with Minikube locally, you'll benefit from the production cluster right as you start. In essence, focus on your containerized workload, and we'll focus on Kubernetes and ensure its security. We manage the worker nodes. We manage bug fixes and patches on the infrastructure. We manage quarterly updates to make sure we stay bleeding edge with upstream Kubernetes software. And then we also monitor and, and secure infrastructure 24 seven. And also, we're future proof. Our cloud controllers are updated, our compute and network and storage layers as well. OK, so for the live demo, let's jump at the screen share so we can have a look at what it looks like from the manager point of view to start your first project. First, you'll navigate to the OVH Cloud Manager. You'll select the Public Cloud tab from the top. And you'll scroll down all the way until you see Manage Kubernetes Services here on the side. Once you've clicked on this page, you'll see you have a, a big blue button to create a new cluster. Let's, cre let's start this process.
First, we'll select the data center where our nodes will be deployed. In this case, I'll choose North America and Beaulieu and BHS5. Next, I'll select the version of our cluster. I'll use the 1.19 since it's recommended. Next, we get to con configure our node pools. This will be the nodes that will be deployed to run our application services. We'll select a three, which is the default, and we'll go with B27, which is a good general purpose instance. Next, we select the billing for these nodes. I'll select monthly since this cluster will be running for a long time. Next, we, let, we get to name our cluster. And this one, I'll call it test Kubernetes cluster. Once we step send here, the operation starts behind the scenes. The cluster is being deployed, the node are getting provisioned, and we're only waiting to get our kube config uh, CTL file. So after a few minutes, you can refresh the page and you'll see your new cluster is now created. You can now click on these three dots and click on Manage Cluster to get more options. From here, we see the status is OK. Again, we see the version, the name of our cluster, and the region. We also have information about the URL to connect to our nodes, as well as the API to connect to the cluster directly. What's interesting to us right now is downloading the kube config file. We'll click on the button and download a local file. We will then copy this file to our server so that we can start using the kubectl command line. Once you've downloaded the configuration file and uploaded it to the server you want to use to administer the cluster, you'll need to install the kubectl CLI. This can easily be done with curl using the following command. First, we'll download the binary from the Kubernetes repositories. Next, we'll ensure that we have the executable flag on the file to make sure that we can run it. And lastly, we'll move the kubectl CLI to, a, to somewhere that is in the path. In this case, user local bin. From there, we can now run kubectl version to get more information just to make sure we configured it properly. As we can see, everything is going well. Next, we need to take the configuration file that we've uploaded and move it to the .cube directory in a file called config. This is the default path kubectl will look for to read your config. Once this is done, we can finally run kubectl get nodes to validate that our nodes are properly deployed. As we can see, all of them are ready. This means we can start deploying our application workload on top of it. For this demo, we'll use Helm for this. Helm is a popular repository for, for public charts based around Kubernetes. So the first step we need to do is download Helm. For this, we're going to use wget. And again, we downloaded it from the Helm website. It comes in a targz format, so we'll need to open it up. And same as before, we'll need to copy the binary in somewhere in our path. User local bin. Once this is completed, we can now proceed to add a repository to Helm. In this case, we'll use Bitnami, which is very popular and contains a multitude of public images. Once this is completed, the last thing we'll do is we'll go ahead and launch a WordPress instance based on the Bitnami repo through Helm on our Kubernetes cluster. So as we can see from the output here, the cluster has been deployed properly, and we can confirm this with kubectl get nodes, get pods, excuse me. And as we can see, we do have our Kubernetes WordPress instance, as well as our MariaDB, which acts as a backend. They're currently not ready, so let's give them a few minutes. 
roughly 80 seconds later, we can see that both our instances are up and running. Now to access these instances, we'll need to find out the URL as well as the actual password to log into the cluster. And this will be achieved by running the following command. So we're telling kubectl to get the secret for the namespace default, the one in which we deployed our application, for our application, my first Kubernetes WordPress, and we'll ask to have an output in JSON format for the data WordPress password. We'll decode that to actually have the ASCII value. So this is the password we can now use to connect inside our WordPress instance, but first we need to find the public IP. For this, we'll use kubectl, get services. And as we can see, our first Kubernetes cluster is running on external IP 51.222.45.83. Let's visit this page and see if we can log in with the provided credentials. So now that we're in our WordPress admin panel, within a few minutes we've deployed our cluster, we've added Helm as a, as a repository, and we've added Bitnami as a repository to Helm, and we've also deployed our first WordPress application inside this cluster. Now that the presentation is over, we'll go over the Q&A session. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm.